Chapter 2 is, is of God and the Holy Trinity, but just a, a brief ref, uh, refreshing of what we ended with last week on chapter 1, that the, we learned that the scriptures were indispensable, hence necessary, and we learned of what necessitated their being necessary, that of redemptive revelation, that the scriptures are identified, they're authoritative, they're perfect, that is to say they're sufficient and clear, and they are and are to be made available in a culture's common vernacular or common language, and they are the final judge and standard in all matters regarding what we are to know, what we are to believe, and what we are to do to be saved, as well as how we are to live unto God. And then furthermore, that they are the very words of God, the inscripturated word of God. And the chapter one ends with our faith is finally resolved, that is in the word of God. So that's just a reminder of uh, summarizing chapter one moving on to chapter 2 today, and we'll spend the entirety of our time here, and hopefully, um, time allowing, we can go through this rather quickly, so if anyone has any questions or comments, we, we can do that this afternoon, hopefully, if we can move through this rather fast. So, this paragraph 2, and I was pointed out by my um, revision crew over here that lives with me that I was referring to the paragraphs as chapters, so I apologize for that, but hopefully you know what I meant. So paragraph one in chapter two, we could entitle this whole paragraph, The Attributes of God, basically. So, but before I read this paragraph in its entirety, I want to point out a few things as, as we read just the very first phrase, and we'll allude to some of these as, as we go through it here. But this, this, the first phrase starts with an assertion. It starts with an assertion. It doesn't appeal to, to us, to the readers, that God exists. It asserts that it is so. So, so notice that. And also in this phrase, the, it uses the word Lord, which infers what? Rule over his people. That is us. And it uses the per- possessive pronoun our, which is the, this, the plural, the same thing as my. So there's possession there, and then the singularity here of but one. And so what this is is a polemic. It denies all other so-called gods. And then as well by stating that God is living and true, recognizes that what? All other gods are what? Dead and inanimate. So just that first phrase there as we read through paragraph one. The Lord our God is but one only living and true God, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and with all most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. I don't know if you noticed the punctuation there, but that is one sentence. If it wasn't about God, we could probably accurately call it a run-on sentence, but there is a lot there. So as we we get into this and and look into this, I want to point out, too, that the framers here, they don't distinguish between the incommunicable and the communicable attributes of God. They just identify them in eight categories. So and those are, are how we're going to look at the confession. So the incommunicable attributes are those attributes that are ascribed to God alone. Right, like his omnipresence, his omnipotence, those type of things, or omnipresence as well. And the communicable attributes are those things that God has attributed to man that in some sense makes us likened unto God, like love, justice, these type of things we share, or God shares with us better yet. So, but they've kind of, this, this paragraph here can be divided up into eight categories in regards to God's attributes here. His singularity. His independence, incomprehensibility, his spirituality, his infinity, sovereignty, love, and justice. 
So these are the eight treatments here that we'll look at. And just on a side here, there's various treatments on the attributes of God out there for, for your perusal and looking at. And there's two that I would, I would commend to you, one to read and then one to listen to, the, the foremost being A.W. Pink's treatment. And it is available at Chapel Library for free. Uh, I actually have the link here for you if you want it afterwards. It's just like a Kindle. Um, it's, I think it's less than 100 pages or whatever, but it's, it's very, very good. And then Stephen J. Lawson, I don't know if some of you are familiar with him, but he done, has done a treatment on the attributes of God by Ligonier. Yeah. I have that DVD as well if, if you would like that. Or you can go on, I think, a Sermon Audio and YouTube has all these, and yeah, they're they good. Yeah, most likely my wife's shaking my head. I think that's probably put up somewhere. Okay. But anyways, I could get you access to it if you want it that bad. So, <laughs> hence the revision crew. All right. So we're going to go through these rather quickly. Um, and we're, we're going to use some scriptures as we go along here. This first phrase here, the Lord our God is but one living and true God. This has reference to God's singularity. Deuteronomy 6.4 from the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God. The Lord is our God. The Lord is one. 1 Corinthians 8.4 towards the end of there, part B. And there is no God but one. And then others, Jeremiah 10.10, 10, uh, 1 Corinthians 8.6, right, just right down from 4. <laughs> and 1 Thessalonians 1.9. But I, I want to read something. It's, it's a little lengthy here from Pink in regards to his treatment on the singularity of God. And, and I will warn you, this, this might come as shocking to you when you, when you hear the, the second part of this, but I want you to consider what he's saying. He says this is in regard to the singularity of God. In the beginning, God, Genesis 1.1, there was a time, if time it could be called, when God, in the unity of his nature, through subsisting equally in three divine persons, dwelt alone. In the beginning, God. There was no heaven where his glory is now particularly manifested. There was no earth to engage his attention. There were no angels to him his praises, no universe to be upheld by the word of his power. There was nothing, no one but God. And that, not for a day, a year, or an age, but from everlasting. During eternity past, God was alone, self-contained, self-sufficient, self-satisfied, in need of nothing. Had a universe, had angels, had human beings been necessary to him in any way, they would also have been called into existence from all eternity. The creating of them when he did added nothing to God essentially. He changes not, Malachi 3.6. Therefore, his essential glory can be neither augmented nor diminished. You cannot add to it nor take away. And so Pink later, he says a few more things, and he later goes on and says this. And, and this struck me years ago when I read this too. He says, Our Lord Jesus Christ added nothing to God in his essential being and glory, either by what he did or suffered. True, gloriously true, he manifested that glory of God to us, but he added nothing to God. Think about that. Think about that. Nothing can make him more or less than he is. Just think of the depths of that reality when we compare that to what Christ's death actually accomplished. It added nothing to God in that regard and to his essential being of who he is. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 15 through 18. Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket and are accounted as the dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust, Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are counted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. In verse 18, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare him with? Who, who is there like our God? He is the one true and living God. Who can add to or take away from the Most High? None. He alone is God. Isaiah 40, 22 through 23. It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, 
who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. God's singularity. And this next phrase, whose subsistence is in and of himself, infinite in being and perfection. This is what we call the independence of God. And I like, I'll tell you a word that I like better, the aseity or aseity of God. Um, I learned that from Dr. Lawson years ago. It means the same thing. It it's, comes from the Latin out of self, and it's actually a word that can only be applied to divinity if you think of it, the self-existence. So this term subsistence here is used to refer to the essence of God as really existing in and of himself. Even his subsistence is him, and that's what, he's consist, that's what he consists of himself, meaning his existence, who he is, how he exists, is in himself. So God is his own source. He derives or is derived from nothing, yet he is the source of all things. Edwards, in, in something I recall reading, calls him the uncaused first cause. Romans 11.36 is a classic text on this. Uh, For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And this, this existence is from all eternity. And God's independence implies his being, that is who he is, is infinite, as well as his perfection or perfections are infinite. So if he is not derived nor dependent on anything, this has always been so. Thus he is infinite in his being and his perfection. Because he is infinite in being, he is self-sufficient. Because he is infinite in perfection, he is self-sustaining. And therefore he is in no need of anything or anyone. Cornelius Van Til summarizes this like this. He says, God is in no sense correlative, that is, has no mutual relationship to or dependent upon anything beside his own being. God is the source of his being, or rather the term source cannot be applied to God. God is absolute. Man. I, I just, anyways, the next phrase here, whose essence cannot be comprehended by any but himself. This speaks to the incomprehensibility of God or the mystery of God, some say. Romans 11, 33, 34. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how unscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? Exodus three fourteen, uh, God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent you. And in them using this text here, Greg Nichols says that this is probably in reference to a, there was a medieval effort to understand God abstractly. You know, who is God? You know, this philosophical thing or whatever. So this reference here is basically saying, you can't do that. God is God. God is God. So these, these two texts here, that we just used, Romans 11, 33, and 34, and then even Exodus 3, 14 with the, with the explanation of perhaps why they use that here. What do these texts demonstrate? They, they're, they're demonstrating that God cannot fully be comprehended in and of himself by a man, of, of which we'll say more about this going forward. So I, I come across something, and Stacy and I were watching YouTube the other night watching different sermons and all types of things like this. And this guy mentioned a pastor that some of us may be familiar with, Stephen Furtick. I say self-proclaimed pastor. So he has a sermon, if we can call it that, entitled, My Maker is My Mirror. And what he is talking about essentially is that how man is created in the image of God. And he uses the text in James about looking in a mirror. And I won't dissect his sermon, but he references this text here in Exodus where God says, I am that I am. And his explanation, his commentary on this, and what he tells his congregation is that what God is trying to relay to Moses is that, and I quote, you are as I am. He relates this or us being made in the image of God to God telling Moses that, Moses, you're like me. So rather than 
I am the self-existing and incomprehensible God and creator of all. John Gill notes on this passage saying that, quote, this signifies the real being of God, his self-existence, and that he is the being of beings, as also it denotes his eternity, his immutability, and his constancy and faithfulness in fulfilling promises, for it includes all time, past, present, and to come. And the sense is, not only I am what I am at the present, but I am what I have been, and I am what I shall be, and I shall be what I am. End quote there on Gil. And as I heard this the other night, I knew we were, were coming to do this, and, and I thought of Jude 10. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand, and they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. So we, we need not tarry here long on this, but, but we need to heed the warning and the reality of those who deface the very word of God and those people who sit under that. Um, just a couple more scriptures here in the incomprehensibility of God. Job is full of these. Job 11, 7 through 8. Can you discover the depths of God? Can you discover the limits of the Almighty? They are as high as the heavens. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? And last night in, in going over this, I thought of what we read in Psalm 139. It says the very thing. If I descend into Sheol, you are there. If, if I go take the wings and, and fly in the heavens, you are there. Job 26, 14. Behold, these are the fringes of his ways. These are the, I have an email thing that keeps popping up, excuse me. These are the fringes of his ways, and how faint a word we hear of him. But his mighty thunder, who can understand? Psalm 145, 3, great is the Lord and highly to be praised, and his greatness is comprehensible. No, his greatness is unsearchable. And I have another quote here. This is almost a text, I mean a, a quote riddled deal here, but I have to confess to you, I've been sitting on this text for some weeks, even a month and a half probably. I've, I've wanted to include it on the handout, but I wanted to save it for this. I hope it is beneficial. It's from Tertullian. He says, quote, Our very incapacity of fully grasping him affords us the idea of what he really is. I'm going to read that again. Our very incapacity of fully grasping him affords us the idea of what he really is. He has presented to our minds in his transcendent greatness as at once known and unknown. And this is the crowning guilt of men, that they will not recognize one of whom they cannot possibly be ignorant. End quote. That is fascinating. The very fact that we cannot comprehend him speaks to who he is, helps us to begin to understand and to, we'll, we'll see later, to apprehend who God is. So, and we're not saying here, the, the framers are not saying that God cannot be known. He can be known. In, in and by what? Creation, which is what we discussed. General revelation, as well as his written word, the special or redemptive revelation. He can be known in that regard so far as he makes himself knowable. But, but what the confession is saying is that no one can know God like God knows himself. That is to say, exhaustively and comprehensively. So, in, in even at that, think of how much God has revealed of himself in his word, and, and yet we get fragments of understanding. Perhaps a lot of that is due to our, our lethargy in the things of God, perhaps, but even of what can be known is almost limitless in some regard when you think of that. So the next phrase here, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body, parts, or passions, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto. This is the spirituality of God they're speaking of here. The classic text on this is John 4, 24. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Now, they're referring to here the Godhead, 
They're not referring to the third person of the Trinity. This is God, the, the triune God, who he was in all eternity. This is, he's, he's most pure. They're saying he is impeccable, that he is, he's non-material, that the properties of matter don't apply to God. With matter can be touched, measured, weighed, and matter changes. We, God does not. We can't equate this to God. And God's invisible. He cannot be seen like pagan gods. Or like Jeremiah refers to in chapter 10, the dumb idols. At Deuteronomy 4, 12 and 15. Then the Lord spoke to you out of the midst of the fire. You heard the sounds of words, but saw no form. There was only a voice. Verse 15. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully, since you saw no form on the day that the Lord spoke to you at Horeb out of the midst of the fire. And then Christ's words in John 5. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen. So what, what they're saying here is that God is saying to he, that he's without a body. He's non-corporeal is another way to say that that he doesn't have hands, feet, eyes, ears, all these type of things. But you think, well, I read in the scripture, the hands of God, the ears of God, the psalmist says he stoops, he bends his ear, the nostrils of God, all these things. So these are what we call anthropomorphisms. These are human traits and characteristics that we attribute to God to help us better understand him. And then when they say without parts, this is, in theology, what they call the simplicity of God. And what they're saying, he's not a simpleton. He is simple. He is one. He is complete. Like a computer is made up of many parts. God doesn't have many parts. God is God. And then without passions, this is, this is an interesting one. This is called the impassibility of God. And I'm, I'm going to lean on Dr. Waldron here. For, for some of these things here, we define passion as implying a strong emotion that has an overpowering and compelling effect. That's what a passion is. So a passion is imposed by an outside force, you see. And such passions cannot be attributed to God. That is something from the outside determining or dictating him. Because he can't be controlled by outside forces. We've, we've already somewhat established this. Now this does not mean, is not saying that God is impersonal that he doesn't have affections. He does, but they arise freely from within himself in his own being. They're not imposed on him from without. And you could look at this in Job chapter 35, 1 through 8, if, if you wanted to at some point. So God doesn't reward or punish us in, in these regards. He, because of his emotions or whatever, he's not swayed in that way. He does these things because he's just and he's good, you see. So... And, and I'll, I'll move on here past some of this thing, but, but something in, in reference to the impassibility of God I read a few years ago. Um, Kevin DeYoung, I think he he'd spoke this at a conference, but it's in a written form. The title of it is, Tis Mystery All, the Immortal Dies. Why the Gospel of Christ's Suffering is More Glorious Because God Does Not Suffer. That is worth an hour of your time to read. Trust me, if you're interested in the God not having passions, the impassibility of God. And I have that link too if, if you're interested afterwards. Then they speak of his, the immorality of God, that God is non-mortal. He can never cease to exist. And then he, he dwells in a light that no man can approach. This means to see God in your flesh is to die. Now, we understand we see God in the incarnate Christ, but this is it's not talking about the incarnate Christ here. So God's spirit, God, the spirituality of God means that God is non-material, non-visible, non-corporeal, non-mortal, and non-approachable in his Godhead, who he is there. This refers to God as he was from all eternity. This is reference to the Father and the Son and the Spirit as they always were. And like I mentioned here, this is not taking account to the, of the incarnation where Christ did become approachable. He did become mortal and he did become um, visible in these type of things. So that's not what they're talking about there. We'll get into that in chapter 8. So this next phrase here, who is immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, every way infinite, most holy, most wise, most free, most absolute. 
This is the infinity of God, or we could say the transcendence of God, which transcendence means it's boundless or endless. So infinity means God transcends, that is, he goes beyond us in space, hence he is immense. He goes beyond us in time, hence he is eternal. He goes beyond us in knowledge, hence he is incomprehensible and most wise. His will is beyond ours. His will is most free. He goes beyond us in power. He is almighty. And in every other way, he is immutable, most holy, and most absolute. In regards to his immutability, already referenced, Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change. Therefore you, O sons of Jacob, are not consumed. God doesn't go back on his promises. He does not change. Revelation 4.8 and Isaiah 6.3 are classic text on the holiness of God. And one called out to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. God is holy. God is absolute. This has a reference into he's not qualified or diminished in any way. He's total. And then Psalm 115.3, But our God is in the heavens. He does whatever he pleases. The next phrase here, working all things according to the counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will for his own glory. This speaks to the sovereignty of God. The sovereignty is supreme power or authority. The the extent of God's sovereignty, or that is to say, what falls under the jurisdiction of God's sovereignty, they tell us all things. What God's, the sovereignty, what rules God's sovereignty? That is to say, what dictates, what governs his sovereignty? Uh, The counsel of his own immutable and most righteous will. And what's the goal or what's the purpose of God's sovereignty? Why does God do what he does? For his own glory, they tell us. Ephesians 1.11 is a classic text on this as well. Isaiah 46.10, Proverbs 16.4. And, and so on. And, and they talk about this a little bit more in paragraph two and then again in chapter three on the decrees. The next phrase, most loving, and we could also say most gracious, most merciful, most long-suffering, most abundant in goodness and truth, uh, most forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin. This is the love of God. So I, I want to say this, that God is n- not just love, period, end of story. He's not. <laughs> you see, the love of God is magnificent because of how it's intricately related to everything else about him. So the love of God is holy. It's perfect love. The love of God is free. He does not and is, is not made to love anyone. His love is free. His love is eternal. This, this is mind-boggling here that he has always loved. He's never began to love. He has simply always love. It's eternal. It's also unconditional. No one merits God's love. God's love is particular. We'll get into that in in chapter 3 of the decrees. God's love is steadfast. It is consistent. God's love is faithful. God's love is even fruitful. That is, it produces love in return to God and to the brethren and even to our neighbors, our fellow man. That's the love of God. The next phrase, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him and with all most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin and who will by no means clear the guilty. This is the justice of God. And and God's justice and holiness are virtually in some regards dual necessities. One necessitates the other kind of, and I would say probably his righteousness would come first if we had to, to, to... put them in a progression there. So, and that is to say, if God is righteous, he must do what is just, right? And doing what is just is what? Therefore righteous. And and as I thought thought through this, that wicked men can do justice, right? And therefore doing justice is a righteous act, but it is not premised on them being righteous. So a judge, a, a man can do the right thing. That is, that is just, right? But he is not doing that because righteousness is what he is, right? There's, there can be some other motives for that. So 
This righteousness flows out of God's holiness, of which everything about him is holy from his anger to his love that we just mentioned. And then they describe his justice positively, rewarding those who seek him. They say the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Hebrews eleven six. When he comes to God, he must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. And then justice negatively described. And with all most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin and who will by no means clear the guilty. In Exodus 34, 7 says, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. So this is a couple of scriptures where you can see where they... Uh, Come up with these phrases here. And this, this brings us to paragraph 2 of chapter 2. And this first paragraph we would call God's relations to his creatures is what this encompasses. And we're going to look at this briefly through a, a fourfold type of exposition of God's relation to his creatures. And what I'm going to do here for the sake of time, instead of read the whole paragraph, I'm just going to read the phrases as we go through them to, to save us a little time here. So the first of these, these four things is God's sufficient independence from his creatures. God having all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself is alone in and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creature which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. We see the overlap from some of his attributes back there. John 5, 26. For just as the Father has life in him, even so he gave life to the Son also to have life in himself. God has life in himself. He doesn't need or nothing has given him life. God is in, is in need of nothing from his creatures. He was in he was in no need, nor does he derive anything by creating. The fact that he has created only manifests his own glory. And then secondly, this is God's dominion or his sovereignty over his creatures in this next phrase. He is the alone fountain of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things. And he hath most sovereign dominion over all creatures, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever himself pleaseth. And you probably notice the, almost the scriptural phrase there from a Romans 11.36, for from him and through him and to him are all things. Revelation 4.11, worthy are you, O Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. And I think here, Daniel 4, 34 through uh, 35 will, will suffice it here and sums it up well. Nebuchadnezzar coming back to himself here. Verse 34 of Daniel chapter 4. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me, and I blessed the Most High, and praised and honored him who lives forever. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. That's just another way to say forever. And all the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? So we see God has the right to do to, by, and upon them or us, his creatures, whatever he pleases. Re remember his attributes that we just, we just went over. Not, capriciousness is not an attribute of our God. Capriciousness is one of the 99 attributes of the Muslim God, but not our God. And when you, when you see this, and we sound, this may sound arrogant, but keep in mind, God is most holy, he is most just, so everything that he does will be so. He is not whimsical. He is not moody, hence capricious. He doesn't get mad and do something out of emotion. That's what they're talking about when he's without passions. So I hope that makes some sense to us here. And then thirdly, God's absolute knowledge of his creatures. In his sight, all things are open and manifest. 
His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, so as nothing to him, it, nothing is to him contingent or uncertain. And, and we've mentioned this already to some degree. God's knowledge is not derived from his creatures and is thus not conditional, not contingent. That, that it, it, God's knowledge is certain knowledge of guaranteed events. God knows everything because he planned it, not because he merely foresees it or foresaw it. And, and we'll get into this, into the decrees some more. So if, if God was basing things on, he, on things that he first foresaw, per se, this would make something, again, outside of God to be the determiner of what God does or doesn't do. So, for example, I, I've had conversations with people, um, particularly in the workplace, well, they don't do that, why should I? They don't do it, I'm not going to do it. Or they get away with it, so I am. Or, you know, all these other things. And I would say, it's like, think about this. You're letting what someone else does or doesn't do determine who or what you are. Don't do that. Don't do that. And, and this is kind of what is not so with God. Nothing outside of himself determines what he does or does not do. So... The, these type of contingencies do not determine what God does or doesn't do. And granted, there are, the, there are things in Scripture, um, conditional covenants and things like this, where if this, then this, and those things are certainly in the Scriptures. But these two are already known. The outcomes are already known by God. And again, we'll talk about that more in chapter 3. His knowledge is absolute. It's complete. There's no I hope so or let's wait and see with God. Hebrews 4.13, and there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to, his, to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Again, Psalm 139, what does the psalmist say? The light, is, it, the darkness is as light to you. In Romans 11.33, again, oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. And fourthly here, I'm going to read the phrase first. He is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, in all his commandments. This is, speaks to God's absolute holiness before them, them being us, the creatures. A God who is absolutely independent of his creatures, who is absolutely sovereign over them, who understands them unconditionally and absolutely, must be absolutely holy in comparison to such creatures. Thus, this, this clause here, he is most holy in all his counsels, works, and commands. Holiness or sanctity conveys God's absolute separation from his creatures. That's where the whole word holy or whole is derived from, separate. That's where we get our word holiday from. It's a separate day from the other days. Hence, God is separate from his creation. He is exalted in his transcendent being and unstained in his moral purity. Nothing he does may be called into question. And to do so is to profane with impure minds and hands the deeds of the absolute holy God. In Psalm 145, 17, the Lord is righteous in most of what he does. No, in all his ways and kind in all his deeds. He is holy before his creatures. So, God, and this, 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 those are the four, and then as we move forward from these four, God has an intrinsic claim upon his creatures, meaning that, intrinsic meaning that his creatures naturally belong to him. So, this intrinsic claim upon his creatures is the necessary consequence of these four things that we just, we just discussed. His self-sufficient independence from his creatures, his dominion or sovereignty over his creatures, his absolute knowledge of his creatures, and his holiness, his separateness of his creatures. Therefore, to him is due from angels and men whatsoever worship, service, or obedience as creatures they owe unto the Creator and whatever he is further pleased to require of them. I'll read Revelations 5, 12 through 14. Worthy is the lamb that was slave to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. I'm going to read that again. I don't remember what that's called 
Um, we, we talked about it uh, a while back when they used the and over and over instead of commas. But, but consider that here. Worthy is the lamb that was, slave, was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And every created thing, he goes on to say, I heard saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. It is due him all honor and glory because of who he is. And he determines what honors and glorifies him. He sets the bar, him alone. And we're going to move into paragraph three here. And this is the triunity of God. And I preface this with a apprehensive apology in how fast and brief we're going to go through this for, for various reasons. For one, this is a, a cursory perusal of this and that the depth of this is, is so vast that we could spend weeks upon this and, and perhaps we should one day teach on the Trinity but I do want to commend to you a very well written book easily to under understandable I won't say easily understood but it is it is it is understandable and it's entitled The Forgotten Trinity by Dr. James White I don't know if some of you guys know him but I have that as well and I think I have that handy, but I, I'll get it for you if you want it. I'll put it like that. So, yes, James White, yes. And you can find multiple things online with him regarding the Trinity. But it is a good book. 100, 220 pages, not, not bad. About six hours of reading. But, um, so, the triunity of God. And, and again, I'm just going to read the phrases and it's going to title them what they're speaking to. We're not going to elaborate on these much. So, in this divine and infinite being, there are three subsistences. The Father, the Word or Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here they're just speaking to and identifying the threeness of the Trinity. Okay? And I don't know if you noticed, they use this, the word subsistence in paragraph one as well. So, in anticipation of this day... I reached out to Dr. Waldron personally to, to make sure the understanding is there, and, and this is how he articulates it and how we understand it. So in paragraph one, subsistence is used to refer to the essence of God as really existing in and of himself. But here in paragraph three, it is used to indicate that the persons really exist as distinct entities. I don't know if that makes sense or muddies the water for you, but it's kind of used the same way, but one and two, the, the, the God himself, and then here to each distinct person in the Godhead. And, and again, this, this really warrants more conversation and teaching here, but just a exposure to such. And then the next phrase, of one substance, power, and eternity, each having the whole divine essence, yet the essence undivided. They're speaking here of the oneness of the Trinity. And then the next phrase, the Father is of none, neither begotten nor proceeding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father, the Holy Spirit proceeding from the Father and the Son. Here this is uh, simply the distinctions of the Trinity. They're distinguishing the persons here. The next phrase, all infinite without beginning, therefore but one God, who is not to be divided in nature and being, but distinguished by several peculiar relative properties and personal relations. So this is an explanation or summary of the Trinity, is, is what this basically is here. And, and, and again, I, I know this is not doing it any justice. but And then the last phrase here, which doctrine of the Trinity is the foundation of all our communion with God and comfortable dependence on Him? And, and this is the relevance of the Trinity, why it's important. This is how we communicate with God. Knowing these things helps us understand this, and it makes us comfortable, is, is what they're saying. So in, in short, this paragraph is basically, um, they've articulated the orthodox belief and understanding of the Trinity from the, the Nicene Council, the Council of Nicaea. They're basically just affirming their belief and adherence to it. They're not trying to defend it. 
They're not trying to explain it. They're basically just assenting to it and aligning with it. And so that's kind of why I've chosen to go through it like that and to not to get into all the intricate details uh, and whatnot there, which perhaps we can do at another time. So I, I do, in, in wrapping up here, and we might have a few minutes, I do understand, and I use the word anemic, the run through of, of paragraphs two and even more particularly three. And, you know, like I said, perhaps we can do something different more in depth at another time. But I do want to, I want to close with an excerpt from Pink's Attributes of God's. This is in the preface. And, and as I read this, I, I want you, I want us to consider even Pastor Furtick's explanation of the great I am, his understanding of that statement in scripture, as well as your own understanding of that scripture and of, of God himself as we, as we understand him now and as we seek to grow in this. So hear the, hear the words of, of Pink here, even, even the warning. He says, quote, and he starts out with several scriptures here. Acquaint now thyself with him, be at peace, thereby good shall come unto thee. This is Job twenty two twenty one. Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, that I am the Lord. This is Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24. And Pink picks up and says, A spiritual and saving knowledge of God is the greatest need of every human creature. The foundation of all true knowledge of God must be a clear mental apprehension of his perfections as revealed in Holy Scripture. An unknown God can neither be trusted, served, nor worshipped. Something more than a theoretical knowledge of God is needed by us. God is only truly known in the soul as we yield ourselves to him, submit to his authority, and regulate all the details of our lives by his holy precepts and commands. Then we shall we know if we follow on in the path of obedience to know the Lord. It's Hosea 6.3. If any man will do his will, he shall know. John 7.17. 7, and then lastly, the people that know their God shall be strong. It's Daniel eleven thirty two. Now, I ask us, what do we know about our God? Do we want to know more and understand more? Are we content? What or how does what we do know and believe about our God affect us? What does it do? Anything? Are we, are you convinced of what you know? Are you or are we naively or even arrogantly assenting to these heavenly things? I would tell you, there's no need to do so, for he has revealed such in his word. Are you, are we growing in the grace and knowledge as we seek and are apprehending him as he has revealed himself? He is a God that can be known through his son, by his spirit, in his word. And, and I pray that we would and do take him at his word. Amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close this with prayer. And then if, if anybody has any questions or comments, we, we can do that if you'd like.